Great, thank you so much. Yeah, it's exciting to think about, um, especially the your deep focus on the industrial sectors of decarbonization. And my study will take us just a step back to for context of how everything will fit together as the city as a whole um, decarbonizes. Uh, so I worked um, with the city of LA and LADWP and residents on like an exciting set of questions, um, especially when we first started several years ago when people weren't even sure quite how to decarbonize. Um, but we, our study looked into what are the pathways and costs to achieve 100% renewable electricity supply while also electrifying um, key end uses. So like the people, the customers, the, the industry and maintaining current high degree of reliability. What are the potential benefits to the environment and health? How might local jobs and the economy change? And how can communities shape these changes to prioritize environmental justice? I want to first give a big shout to our advisory group, which represented different communities across the city. It was their questions that motivated the breadth of the study. And it was important to us to provide them meaningful, transparent, and understandable information. To give you a sense of um, uh, what, what we were doing in the study, one of the things that uh, made the study groundbreaking was the amount of computing power. I work at the Department of Energy's uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And, and the questions that um, City of LA faces in its, uh, in its transition to clean energy affects so many different aspects of the city. And so we brought in a lot of computing power to see how do these all interrelate. And this gives you, uh, this animation that I'm starting gives you a little sense of some of the data behind the study. Where we zooming in, we're looking at the city of LA in 2045, and each of these dots represents a different customer and their demand for electricity. We can zoom in just on the electric vehicle loads. In 2045, we know there's going to be a lot of electric vehicle charging. And so to understand how to meet that charging with 100% renewables, we need to know, you know, where does that take place? How much, how much of that might be flexible in terms of when and where that charging can take place. And we layer onto that our other um, modeling of like buildings, for, for example, like as we electrify end uses in the buildings, uh, dryers, electric dryers or uh, cooking, you know, as things electrify in the home, how does that affect the demand for electricity? And we, can look at all of that together under different types of like how much energy efficiency or electrification, different different questions. We, we can um, interrogate this information in many different ways, but once we put it all together, we can say, all right, well, for a given customer, how much is it economical for them to offset their own generation? Um, I mean, offset their own demand for electricity with their own rooftop solar. Or, you know, how does this all affect the distribution grid? Where do we need upgrades on the distribution grid to manage these changes? Or where could solar help avoid um, uh, the need for upgrades? And then, you know, with all of this together, uh, you know, how does LADWP make sure that it can reliably serve electricity to each of these points um, at all times of the year, no matter what happens? So um, that is just kind of an overview of the, of the big picture. I will turn now to some of the select results. First, I'm going to talk about the customer, what their demand for electricity might be and how they might self-supply some of that demand with rooftop solar. Then I will describe how the study can take different pathways to meet its 100% renewable energy target. And then I'll talk about environmental benefits. And finally, I'll briefly mention um, some of the energy justice implications. So to understand what LED needs to build to be 100% renewable energy, we first need to understand what the customer's role might be over time. Uh, this figure shows peak demand for electricity between now on the left and 2045 on the right for three different sets of assumptions about energy efficiency targets, how much um, natural gas and gasoline today might be replaced with electrification, and um, and how flexible that um, demand for electricity might be. Across all these projections, uh, we can see that the contribution to peak demand from residential and commercial buildings represented in the orange and green colors uh, could remain fairly flat through 2045. 
which is showing us that the growth due to electrification of end uses is getting offset by the benefits of energy efficiency. Um, the main cause for the increase in peak demand um, is due to the growth in electric vehicle charging represented in this figure in blue. One other point to illustrate, um, today in LA, the peak demand for electricity occurs in the afternoon. So think of the hottest days and all the air conditioning load. In the future, the timing could actually be based um, on when the electric vehicle take, charging takes place on those hot days. Uh, so when we assume more access to workplace charging, which we do in the, in the middle high projections, uh, the peak demand occurs early afternoon at two o'clock, um, which is great because that uh, better aligns with solar generation. In, uh, in contrast, we have one scenario called stress that assumes almost all vehicle charging takes place in the evening. And there in that scenario, the peak demand takes place at 7 p.m., which is after the sun sets. So it really shows the value in having access to charging in locations where people leave their cars during the day. Next, we turn to customer demand for rooftop solar. Our study illustrates a dramatic growth in rooftop solar, um, suggesting that most customers would save money on their electricity bills by owning their own solar, whether it is on their rooftop or in a neighborhood location. Not everyone will buy solar, um, but we still expect growth to occur. And in our study, it, it grew from 6% of single family homes today to 22 to 38% of homes, uh, depending on the scenario. Our study also identifies locations that could support community um, owned solar so that residents of multifamily solars, residents of multifamily buildings can own solar too. LADWP needs to anticipate how much growth of customer-owned solar could occur because this affects what else LADWP would need to build to meet its 100% renewable energy target. So how could LADWP supply all this demand um, with renewable electricity? So remember, we're not just meeting this new demand due to electrification, but we're replacing the generation that we already have. So that's two sets of simultaneous changes going on on, on the system today. Um, in all scenarios, uh, we, are we see that wind and solar provide 69 to 87% of future electricity demand. That means for LA, all roads to around 90% renewable energy are very similar. So LA can get started today, today knowing um, that all options are similar to to around 90%. And the pathways really diverge going from 90 to 100% renewable energy. That's where we have different options and the city can make different choices based on priorities. This last 10% is what is needed for reliability during periods of very low wind and solar, extremely high demand, and unplanned events like transmission outages, or even um, a weather event that we haven't experienced yet. To meet this last 10%, the study builds new local power plants with storable renewable fuels um, to maintain reliability. Basically, we want something that can come up and come online very quickly and then run for several days in a row if there's some event um, that, that uh, is unusual. Because it is important in this future grid with so much of electrification to make sure we, the, the power stays on. So across all scenarios, we have different um, levels of electrification efficiency and flexible load, uh, significant customer rooftop solar, renewable, different types of renewable energy, storage, new transmission distribution lines. And then finally, where the scenarios really differ, where the choices for LA are, are how do we meet that last 10%? And the significant change from today is one, there's, there's more of everything, right? Because so we're replacing uh, natural gas and coal, but also today we're running natural gas daily and these same types of power plants in the future will run infrequently, but also with, the, with renewable fuels like green hydrogen. So how can we get to 100% uh, renewable electricity? Let's look at a scenario that achieves this by 2035, which is also now the formal target for the city and utility. Uh, and this will vary slightly compared to what LADWP actually 
builds, um, but this was our scenario that we used um, to look at this uh, type of target. So we start in 2020 with a focus on just a few of the renewable technologies. Today, LADWP generates close to half of its electricity using renewable and zero carbon fuels, including hydropower and nuclear. In 2020, customers owned 340 megawatts of solar on their roofs, and LADWP had solar, wind, storage, and some geothermal. And the chart on the right shows the overall mix of technologies in LADWP's portfolio um, in 2020. Now let's advance five years to 2025. In these five years, under this scenario, customers doubled their solar, but LADWP significantly adds solar co-located with batteries and wind, plus some standalone solar, geothermal, and batteries. Collectively, all this new generation would add uh, would allow LADWP to meet 90% of its electricity using clean fuels. Now let's step ahead another five years. By 2030, the pace of customer solar adoption has more than tripled. And for LADWP to move from 90 to 98% clean generation, it adds some solar co-located with batteries. It skips standalone solar and mostly adds wind and geothermal power plants to help meet the times when solar generation is low or when demand is especially high. Finally, in 2035, this scenario meets its 100% clean energy target. Customers have added solar, LADWP has added some solar, wind, and batteries to meet the growing electricity demand, but primarily to address this last 2% of the target and to keep the lights on when unexpected events occur, LADWP has replaced its natural gas plants with power plants that run on LADWP produced hydrogen, which are needed infrequently. So we spent a lot of time digging into those different pathways to make sure these are actually reliable and doable. Um, and our study uh, was showing with, you know, that 100% renewable energy is achievable. And if it's coupled with electrification of other sectors, provide significant greenhouse gas, air quality, and public health benefits. So let's turn now to some of those other benefits. This figure shows the drop in greenhouse gas emissions that occur across our set of four scenarios with high electrification of vehicles and building and uses. So electrifying cooking, electrifying your vehicles. Starting on the left in 2020, across all the scenarios, uh, greenhouse gas emissions fell by um, rapidly by 2025 um, in the power sector represented in purple due to the retirement of coal. So that alone makes a big change. And then these life cycle greenhouse gas emissions fall further uh, in this scenario in 2035 as natural gas is retired. But the largest greenhouse gas reductions occur um, with the adoption of electric vehicles in green. The simultaneous decarbonization of the power sector coupled with electrification of other sectors leads to dramatic reductions in annual greenhouse gas benefits. I mean, annual in greenhouse gas emissions. So the LA 100 study did not just look at greenhouse gases. We also um, looked at other sources, um, other pollutants that um, impact air quality and public health. So two pollutants that we care most about are fine particulate matter. So these are tiny particles that are 3% as wide as the human hair and can go deep into our lungs. And ozone, which is not emitted, but is formed in the atmosphere and can cause asthma. All um, scenarios in our study achieved a six to 8% reduction in concentrations of fine particulate matter, um, mostly because of the electrification of light duty vehicles and natural gas in homes and businesses. This number might seem small, but it is significant because it took the entire South Coast uh, region six years to achieve a similar reduction, focusing on reducing emissions on some of the largest emission sources. Whereas our study was just on the city of LA and included um, and did not include some of the big sources um, such as medium and heavy duty trucks. So we didn't electrify some of the the industry that you're focused on today, uh, we didn't electrify in our study, um, but those would also yield um, significant environmental benefits. 
Long-term breathing of fine particulate matter can lead to early death. And because of the six to 8% reduction in, in particulate matter concentration, there's a significant public health benefit. $1.5 billion in health savings in just the year 2045 due to reduction in deaths, cardiovascular disease, and other diseases caused by this pollutant. So you also could imagine that being the case with other years as well. Um, and last, um, our study shows that all communities um, will benefit in the clean energy transition, especially in terms of the air quality improvements. Um, but improving equity and participation and outcomes would require this to be integrated into the design of policies and programs. And that's a focus of um, more recent collaboration between um, LADWP and NREL and the community, uh, which I don't have time to get into today. Um, and then uh, if you wanna learn more about the study, la100.org has our full report and lots of um, videos and, and data visualizations to play around with.